Hi, I'm Paul Lipton. And I'm Brad Jenneru from Agma Healthcare. Join us at SIM 2018, May 31st to June 2nd. We'll work with you to build your enterprise imaging strategy, build out your enterprise imaging platform, and also build out your augmented intelligence strategy. We'll be at booth 310 at the Gaylord National Resort, SIM 2018, May 31st to June 2nd. See you there. Hello and welcome to our round table on open source and open standards in imaging informatics. Uh, my name is Paul Naji. I am an associate professor here at Johns Hopkins University and I have the privilege to be uh, the SIM chair, uh, at least for the next two weeks. And uh, today we brought together uh, a, a panel of authors on a special issue of JDI. Uh, it was coming out in, in it's just been released. There is a, in your GoToMeeting control panel, you'll see an ability to uh, ask questions. Uh, I'll be monitoring those questions as your moderator and be able to have a Q&A session as uh, each of our authors presents uh, their parts, uh, their papers to uh, to the group. This is a, a great time. A little over 10 years ago in 2007, uh, the journal Digital Imaging, we released our first all open access issue on open source and open standards. And it really was in the recognition of how much innovation is driven uh, through the open source community of collaborating and tools. And, and truly a recognition of how much we as a society and as an industry have to thank for uh, the, the high impact of the DICOM standard. Uh, and uh, there's papers on the original, as uh, not everyone might know, that the, the DICOM standard was originally created as an open source reference implementation to, 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 to industry to help them understand how to do association negotiations and to leverage DICOM. Uh, and so really we have a lot to thank on open source and how it's been really a key uh, agent for being able to disseminate uh, open standards for improving interoperability, which has really made a great uh, ability for us to innovate within the field of imaging informatics and make an impact on clinical care. Uh, in this issue in 2007, we had uh, a dozen articles, and we had articles about uh, about DICOM. We had articles about uh, the great open source DVTK program, which is really a, a, the de facto troubleshooting tool for managing DICOM associations between, uh, between DICOM uh, sources uh, and like modalities. And we also had articles on DCM for Shea, uh, which was really a foundational PAC system, which was, which was really instrumental in helping all kinds of researchers and educators create teaching file systems, uh, QA and research systems. So uh, these articles were really, um, really impactful. And this was over 10 years ago. And what's interesting is even just last year alone, uh, uh, these, these articles were accessed over 17,000 times. I also wanted to mention uh, the ITK, the image translation registration libraries, which was enabling research environments. These articles, even last year, were downloaded over 17,000 times. And on average, these articles were cited over 38 times by other peer reviewed publications. In the academic world, that is a spectacular uh, rating of just having an enormous impact on these articles on the conversations that others are having and uh, the impact on, uh, on our, our academic industry. And so today, uh, in, uh, today is, uh, we have released a new issue of JDI. Our June issue is focusing on open source and open standards. I've brought together uh, a great panel uh, of, uh, of some of the authors of these articles uh, to come and talk about uh, what has changed in the past 10 years and what areas of interest they have uh, around uh, different open source components. In, in the 2018 issue, uh, Steve Langer has been my uh, guest editor for putting this together. And I wanted to share, I broke the articles into like three different areas. Uh, the first area is really uh, the changes that we've seen in the last 10 years in standards development. Uh, and we've seen enormous changes in a move from, uh, from DICOM to DICOM web, from HL7 version 2 to FHIR, this introduction of internet standards uh, and RESTful APIs to be able to really enable a new generation of developers uh, to be able to harness better interoperability at a lower cost. And so we've got several articles talking about this. Um, one is, uh, from, uh, is from Mohanad Hussain, and this is about the Happy Fire Server, which is one, one of the most popular open source HL7 uh, fire servers out there, and how to use it uh, to be able to, to play with that server and to test it with the SIM uh, imaging data set. The second one is uh, Peter Kamel, who uh, won the two, uh, 2016 SIM uh, 
hackathon competition with his patient-centered radiology uh, using the FHIR standard in DICOM web, and it's an introduction to how to use FHIR and how you could build a clinical work list off of uh, some of the, the FHIR APIs. Uh, we have a, an article on uh, standards, uh, lexicons, coding systems, and ontologies by Kenneth Wang. And this is really an important article about how do we build structured reports and semantic computation into our imaging so that we can uh, do get better knowledge representation out of that data and, uh, and, and tied into it. And lastly, uh, the author for today, we have Brad Genero, who wrote an article around DICOM web. And really, this, this how, how transformative this is to the DICOM standard, uh, he'll be presenting about how its application for bringing uh, DICOM uh, into this new generation of mobile devices and uh, internet accessible uh, medical imaging applications. So I grouped a set of the articles I think were tied to medical standards. A whole other group of articles within the same open access issue really show just how much has changed in the imaging informatics research arena. Uh, and it's really remarkable. We have an article from Steve Langer on collaborative and reproducible research goals and challenges uh, from one of our SIM sessions at the annual meeting last year. Uh, we have an article uh, by Ziv Yanov around simple ITK image analysis notebooks. And this uh, and there's a few articles about really how do we've moved into uh, computational computing on the cloud using Jupyter Notebooks, which are really exciting web-based computational scientific notebooks that are able to take a Python script or R script or uh, some sort of uh, language and be able to help you run it virtually on a cloud and be able to share it with others. So this is really going to be a key ingredient for education and enabling reproducible research within our industry. Uh, we have the how to take advantage of cloud architectures and container-based clinical solutions for portable and reproducible image analysis by Jordan Matelski. Uh, this is and and we have uh, towards portable large-scale image processing with high-performance computing uh, with Ian Cal Hugh and Bennett Landman at Vanderbilt. And this is about leveraging XNAT for really scaling it for multiple clinical trials within in a academic medical center. Very exciting, amazing taking advantage of cloud technologies. And, uh, and, and these new uh, imaging platforms to conduct research. And the article we're going to talk about today, the author in the room is Tars Lakhani, who's going to be talking about uh, an introductory article, a Hello World Deep Learning in Medical Imaging, really introducing the concept of deep learning and leveraging uh, TensorFlow for being able to do, building a classification scheme within medical imaging. Uh, and so these are all educational articles trying to make the technology more accessible and approachable. Uh, and also helping get, uh, help, hopefully inspiring other people to want to participate with some of these great open source communities. The last grouping of articles I have, uh, I put into new open source projects that have really come about within the last 10 years. Uh, one has been really the excitement around uh, the Raspberry Pi and how we could use it to help be a sensor environment and a, a way for automation within the reading room. And this is from Howard Chen and Nathan Cross at Penn. Uh, and, uh, and, and an article on Orthonc ecosystem for medical imaging. Orthonc is a, is a relatively newer uh, DICOM vendor neutral archive open source infrastructure, which has become incredibly popular for, as a back end for a lot of uh, DICOM based applications. And the author in the room uh, for today is uh, Judy Kjitoya and uh, from, uh, from Indiana University, and she'll be talking about a platform for innovation and standards evaluation a case study from the OpenMRS Open Source Radiology Information System. OpenMRS is one of the most popular uh, EMR systems that are open source available that is being developed on throughout the world. And so I've tried to bring a snapshot of the different types of articles in, in this issue. If you'll look into your go-to control panel, you should see uh, one of the tabs has is on handouts. And if you actually see the handouts, you actually can have a, there's a link where you can click on and you can get access immediately to all these articles. These articles have all been published within JDI. They're on our open, uh, they're open on our online portal, and they've all been uh, designated as open access, which means they're open for anybody to download and read. So I encourage you to download the articles and follow along as we have some of the authors present their material. And uh, with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Stephen Langer. Uh, uh, Steve is a professor of imaging informatics at Mayo Clinic. He is the co-director of the Radiology Informatics Lab and chair of Enterprise Radiology Architecture and Standards. 
He co-chairs uh, both the SIM Hackathon and the Machine Learning Committees at SIM, and is an invited speaker for several societies and vendor conferences, and is an associate editor for JDI, and a co-founder of Flow Sigma and Evidentia. Steve? Thanks, Paul, for the introduction, and thank everybody for attending today. As Paul mentioned, it's been my honor and privilege to um, be a co-chair on these two committees, and on first blush, you might not think there's a lot in common between the Hackathon Committee, for those of you who know what it does, and the Machine Learning Committee, but on deeper reflection, you find out that there is actually quite a bit of cross-pollinization possible between those two groups. But we've jumped already down into the weeds, and maybe just for a, a look back at our ancestors and how we got here, it's worth thinking about what some of the roots of the open source. And so I thought we'd give some credit to you know why we're here. And so the fundamental questions are FOSS, what, why, and how? And I always use the term FOSS for free and open source software. Richard Stallman, kind of one of our founding fathers, Richard Stallman back from MIT in the late 70s and through the 80s and stuff, uh, came up with the new foundation, GNU, which was an iterative acronym, meaning GNU's not Unix. And so it, it, it self-reflects. But anyway, uh, the new foundation came up with multiple free implementations of things that we take for granted today, such as the GCC compiler, which is broadly used on pretty much every free Unix knockoff there is, as well as other things. And what uh, what Mr. Stallman was meaning when he said freedom was free is in speech, not beer. In other words, there's lots of places you can go if you want to download a free app for your for your Android, but you don't own the source. You can't crack open the source and see what that code really does and what it might be doing to you or getting from you. Um, so freedom is not necessarily freedom from paying for the software, but it's once you get it, can you do what you want with it? Do you truly own it or don't you? Um, there's an analogy today is that there's a lot of uh, states that are experimenting with right to repair laws because it's often the case that uh, you void your warranty or something if you try to crack open your phone and repair something yourself. So California, for instance, is one that's working on a right to repair law. Another reason for open source is transparency. We've already alluded to why that's useful. If you don't have, if you can't see the code, you really don't know what it's doing. And collaborative innovation. You know, with open APIs and transport protocols, there's no artificial roadblocks between you and I exchanging both data uh, at rest and data over the wire. So why was this? Um, why did this finally come to fruition uh, in medical informatics? Well, for those who've been around in this for a while, realize that pre-1993, uh, it was enormously expensive, expensive to exchange imaging data from, say, one vendor's CT scanner and view it on another vendor's PACs, uh, if it was even possible. Uh, along came uh, DICOM 3.0 in 1993, was demonstrated by something called the central test node, that our colleagues in Mallinckrodt did and demonstrated at that RSNA, and it finally implemented an open transport mechanism and file format called DICOM 3.0, which, uh, which Brad will talk about later, its successor. Um, so how are these open things expressed and how are they operationalized? Well, basically, three or four things are necessary. There's open licenses like the GPL, the new public license, and there's multiple variations of it. There's BSD licenses from Berkeley, there's MIT licenses. And some of them are more or less um, industry friendly. You wanna make sure that if you're developing something and you want it to be widely embraced, uh, you wanna choose something that's probably a more business friendly license than something, uh, something like the GPL one, which was uh, often considered almost viral in that anything that touched it had to be open as well. Then there's code sharing. It's like, well, if you're going to say that this is transparent, other people want to see that code, and what's an easy way to express that today that's widely done on GitHub? And then there's open APIs. It's not just sufficient that you have maybe an open file format, but if you can't transport it over the wire in an open way, that kind of limits how, how uh, accessible that is. And then finally, the open data formats themselves. I mean, do I need to have some kind of secret parser in order to crack open your files? or is it a well-understood format? Next slide, please. The Hackathon Committee exists basically to address some of those last two things, the open APIs and 
and playing with the f file formats. My co-chair on this happens to be Mark Coley from UCSF. And when uh, the hackathon uh, committee first put up a persistent presence on Amazon's cloud services, uh, he organized a, a large group of people, um, Judy was one of them, to help flesh out a correlated data set such that there is actually a simulated VNA that speaks DICOM web and a simulated EMR that speaks fire. And there's five pseudo patients defined across those two systems and they have correlated data sets so that people when they come either to the annual meeting or since this is a persistent round the year thing, um, people can develop applications and prove out in their learning labs and stuff on realistic patient data sets, which is useful. Um, another thing that is maybe somewhat less obvious though, is how you do data mining, both for research purposes or even in your clinical workflows. Suppose you want to know exactly what the state is of a given patient exam, or you want to say find um, uh, certain types of study for a research protocol. Well, in some sense, every medical device that's HIPAA compliant has some base set of that information, but it may, may not be rich enough, and also you'd have to hunt from machine to machine to find it. Um, some people, uh, my colleague uh, Brad Erickson and I recently worked through an IHE committee to come up with something called IHE SOL, Standardized Operational Logging of Events, and that's actually in test implementation now. So IHE SOL compliant vendors or systems uh, export their system logs in a standard format to a central syslog server, making it much easier for you to do either clinical workflow, um, um, data mining, or, or research purposes. And so that's what the hackathon committee does, and we'll, we'll hear some more about that. Maybe Brad will allude to it. But uh, another thing is the machine learning committee. Uh, how do you do reproducible results? We all know that the, you know, the, the, the holy grail of science is that what we write, others should be able to reproduce. Well, I come from a background in, in particle physics, and not everybody has a synchrotron in their backyard. But in the case of something that's small enough that it can be reproduced, we should be able to do that if authors are, are forthcoming enough with both their code and data. And so um, in machine learning, that's possible. The question is, is, is it realized in practice? And it, the answer is it depends. Um, some, some authors are willing to share both code and data, but the data can be kind of tricky because of both the PHI reasons. And in many cases, it's viewed as a competitive advantage to not share that. But what we can do then is at least share, uh, if, if not both code and data, uh, the models derived from some of the machine learning uh, papers, and we can com compare results of different models on publicized data sets where those exist. So then the problem becomes, are there sufficient um, availability of different da public data sets? Are they well curated and, and things like that? And that turns out to be something that the machine learning committee of SIM also takes a very high interest in and being able to publish both the data and some building blocks for that code is something that we're gonna hear uh, Paris talk about uh, in, after, after Brad gives his talk. So with that, I'll uh, turn it over to, to Brad to take us, take us to the next step. Thank you, Steve. Uh, so Brad Genero is a manager of product management and user experience for uh, Agfa Healthcare based in Waterloo, Canada. He's responsible for analytics, web and mobile technologies. He is the industry co-chair for DICOM Working Group 27 for Web Technologies, co-chair of DICOM Working Group 2020 for Integration of Imaging and Information Systems, and co-chair of HL7 Imaging Integration. His career is marked and, and defined by integrations of all kinds, having spent a decade in the Canadian healthcare IT system prior to joining the medical imaging community. Brad? Oh, thank you very much, Paul, and good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be talking to you today about DICOM Web, uh, the background and application of the web standard for medical imaging. So this is a paper that we had put together uh, with my co-authors, uh, Don, Kinson, Rob, Charles, Kevin, and Elliot, a real subset of the, the brains behind some of the, the uh, imaging uh, standards uh, group, uh, an incredible group of people that uh, collaborated for this paper. Uh, what I want to talk to you today about is uh, why DICOM Web became so important, uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about what is DICOM Web and then where you could learn more. Perfect. All right, so, so why DICOM for the web? Well, 
DICOM Web started out back in 2003 with the advent of what was called Watto, uh, which became Watto URI. Uh, and one of the things that we found back then, uh, growing into today's technologies, is that the use cases themselves have actually started to shift. Uh, so uh, it's no longer just we need an electric, electronic way of uh, seeing images, but we actually need to advance the use cases uh, and, and drive more value uh, and opportunity in how we're able to uh, uh, communicate not only imaging but the metadata that goes along with it. So looking at uh, patient-centric care uh, where we, we care around the patient, uh, looking at value-based care uh, where we want to make sure for example that we're imaging uh, using the, the right study for the right patient at the right time and then moving beyond to enterprise imaging uh, which is looking at not only just the classical radiology but also visible light uh, and all sorts of other uh, DICOM-esque um, even, like, even non-DICOM content, ECGs, all the other stuff that, that forms the patient record from the imaging and modality side. There's an ever-increasing demand for uh, being able to access any image at any time, anywhere I happen to be, whether it's at my, uh, my desktop, my reading workstation, uh, or if I'm at home, or if I'm uh, on the go uh, in a subway or an airport on my mobile phone, I need to be able to access those images wherever I happen to be. Uh, it's also critically important that uh, it is secure uh, so that uh, we're able to uh, authenticate the users uh, and authorize them that they are indeed allowed to access those particular images for that particular patient, uh, regardless if it's uh, from what department uh, or uh, if it's a VIP patient. All those sorts of uh, things that we think about on the EMR world also applies to medical imaging as well. Uh, there's increasing demands on technologies. We, we need to push bigger data down uh, the pipes, uh, but also the capabilities have grown. Uh, so uh, there are bigger pipes available that we can uh, now move things like pathology uh, slides around back and forth. We're also seeing in other industries uh, the advent of technology that can be applied to medical imaging. Uh, so looking at like image sharing networks, uh, there's a lot of concepts that can be bled over into uh, medical imaging and the way that we uh, actually operate. So looking at things like rounds, uh, isn't it great that we have like discussion threads and bulletin boards and things like this uh, that we can integrate imaging into? Uh, and then, you know, in today's technology, looking at machine learning and artificial intelligence, both things that are happening outside the medical imaging industry uh, and it's quickly, quickly growing and uh, becoming very important that, that we look at this as part of uh, uh, imaging analytics in uh, in the imaging departments. Uh, and the last piece is that developer expectations of using libraries common amongst these other verticals are continuing to grow. So for example, anyone who's coming out of university who knows how to program things uh, for Facebook or for Twitter or for the airline industry or for banking, uh, for web banking, that sort of thing, uh, they expect a certain level of API that they can get access to uh, so that they could rapidly consume and rapidly develop, turn over, test, and iterate very quickly to develop new technologies very fast. Uh, and so what we've done in the standards community is actually taken and built up DICOM Web uh, and hand in hand with HL7 Fire, which is the RESTful version of HL7, to really deliver a full suite of uh, access to uh, imaging and on imaging data via APIs. So what is DICOM Web? It is RESTful HTTP services for interacting with medical images, structures, and metadata. Uh, so this really consists of five different services. Uh, we've got the uh, query, uh, so Keto RS. We have uh, retrieve, uh, which is also known as Watto RS. We have storing, uh, called Sto RS. Uh, we can drive workflow uh, using something called UPS RS, and we can uh, discover services that are available through capabilities uh, service, where we can say, hey, uh, imaging server, what do you actually support? So if we were to walk through a, a couple of quick examples, uh, we can do study discovery. So here I'm asking, uh, a imaging server, what studies do you have for John Doe? Uh, you see I make my RESTful web query uh, where I do slash studies slash the DICOM tag equals John Doe and I get back a response of all the studies that are available for that, uh, for that patient. If I actually want to dig a little deeper and actually retrieve images from a study, it's, it's very similar. Uh, I can again use my 
RESTful query uh, to ask for all the images in series four, five, six, that's part of study one, two, three, that I discovered using the uh, query uh, uh, API. So we're able to build out this full end-to-end uh, -end imaging integration that I can then plug into any sort of application. It can plug into traditional packs, it can plug into EMRs, it can plug into rounds applications, it can plug in really to where you happen to need it. So where can you find out more about DICOM Web? So uh, there's a paper that we put together. Uh, it, it provides you all of the, the use cases uh, and you know uh, the rationale behind the, the kind of changing of uh, the environments and the use cases over time. Uh, we've also recently revamped the DICOM website uh, and there's a whole section on DICOM Web including a DICOM web cheat sheet, which is a one pager that shows you all the interactions that uh, you can do uh, using a DICOM web server. Uh, and then the other uh, four pieces here is if, if you come to SIM, there are some fantastic topics uh, that you can, that are covering DICOM web along with fire uh, and uh, uh, IEG profiles as well. So we've got the state of the standards. Uh, we have a, a round table about DICOM web and fire. Uh, we have a learning lab uh, for hacking with Fire and, and DICOM Web, and of course we've got the SIM Hackathon, uh, which uh, you can actually go out uh, and build using the SIM APIs that they're hosting Fire and DICOM Web to really uh, build some really cool integrations. Uh, so hope to see you at SIM, and there's a lot of stuff on DICOM Web. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Brad. Our, our next uh, speaker and author is Dr. Paris Lakani. He serves as the Clinical Director for Imaging Informatics and Assistant Professor in the Department of Radiology at Thomas Jefferson University Hospital. He completed his medical school at the University of Pennsylvania, his residency and clinical fellowship at the Hospital of the University of, of Pennsylvania, and Imaging Informatics Fellowship at the University of Maryland. He currently serves on the SIM Machine Intelligence Committee, the RSNA, RADLEX, and Radiology Reporting Subcommittees, and the ACR Informatics Innovation Council. Paris? Thank you, Paul, for the introduction, and it's a pleasure to be here for this webinar. Um, I'm here to discuss open source tools for machine and deep learning, and I've been interested in machine learning for the last two years, and um, and wrote an article, um, which I'll go over in the next few slides, uh, with uh, Dr. Paul Naji, as well as George Chi, who are co-authors on the article, um, who are also part of the SIM Machine Learning Committee as well as two medical students at Jefferson, Carl Pett and Daniel Gray. Um, so if we can get to the next slide. So machine learning, as you all know, or many of you know, uh, has been uh, quite popular lately. This is a graph of machine learning papers in the archive, which is a preprint server uh, com uh, that's commonly used in the engineering world. And as you can see here, the number of machine learning articles has just skyrocketed since 2016 um, because of the interest in machine learning. Um, and if you can go to the next slide. And part of the reason why I think there is interest in machine learning is that it's actually more accessible. You know, we talk about GPUs and big data, but I think one of the reasons why people are doing machine learning is because of these frameworks, which are for the most part open source, and, and the, these frameworks uh, have made it more accessible to do a lot of the heavy, they do a lot of the heavy lifting for deep learning and machine learning. So here are some of the frameworks that are available, you know, CAFE, which was uh, open sourced by Berkeley, Theano, which has been around for a long time, Torch, um, which Facebook uses quite a bit now, PyTorch, also from Facebook, TensorFlow, Google, CNTK, Microsoft, MXNet, Amazon, um, and there are many more actually. Um, and then there's also something called Keras, which is very popular, which is an API or a deep learning library that can use TensorFlow or Theano or CNTK on the back end. So can you go to the next slide? So one of the, um, the importance of toolkits and frameworks is that it can encourage reproducibility. You know, if I if I generate something using TensorFlow, I can share that code, and someone else can then get TensorFlow and reproduce that research or reproduce that experiment. Um, it also allows for more rapid progress in machine and deep learning. I don't have to code a net from scratch, which is very hard to do. I can just basically understand how to use these frameworks. Um, and then it also allows for fast prototyping. So if I have data and I want to 
see if I can train the data using a machine learning network or whatever I'm going to be doing. I can prototype that pretty quickly and see if that's uh, you know trainable data. And uh, can you go to the next slide? So this is um, as of early 2017. This is from uh, Andre Karpathy, who is a machine learning researcher uh, at Open. Actually, now he works for Tesla, but he had compiled a list of archive papers uh, and broken it down by the framework that was used in those papers or mentioned. Um, and if you can just go over, yep, there you go. So TensorFlow is the most popular framework right now, at least if you go by the archive papers, and, and about 9% of papers mention it. Keras is very popular as well, about 2 to 3%. And then, and then I mentioned PyTorch here because it's rising in popularity. And I would say uh, most people right now who are getting into deep learning are using PyTorch or Keras um, or TensorFlow. One of these three things are, are rising in popularity very quickly. I think a lot of it's because they're well-documented. They all use Python, which is a very friendly and popular language for machine learning. And they're very flexible. They can work with text. They can work with you know, um, images. Uh, and so I think that flexibility is also very nice to have. So can you go to the next slide? So in this tutorial, I'm going to be going over Keras, um, which is a high-level API that simplifies the use of machine learning frameworks. It works with Theano, TensorFlow, or CNTK. It's written in Python. It's very well documented. Uh, and there's a link to Keras if you want to download it. Next slide. And this is the title of the article that is in that special uh, edition of JDI, which is titled Hello World, Deep Learning and Medical Imaging, and the authors are listed there. Uh, and then can you go to the next slide? So the idea with this article was, A, can we get people started with deep learning who are new to the field uh, by means of a tutorial? Um, but we also wanted to share Python code, a model, and data all within the framework of a manuscript. So the idea was that people who are publishing in the future could sort of share this concept or model this concept. So if they're writing a research paper, if they share code, uh, they share the model, and they share the data, then it can encourage reproducible research. So we wanted to do this within the framework of a tutorial as well as uh, within the framework of a manuscript. Next slide. So this is the GitHub site. Um, it's the Imaging Informatics Machine Learning site hosted by SIM. And so you can, anyone can go to this site. And uh, as you can see here on this GitHub site, you can actually download a Docker image containing Keras, TensorFlow, as well as JupyterLab, which, uh, where you can run this tutorial. And then you can also click on the link, Hello World Deep Learning. So can you um, go to the next slide? And if you click on that link, you will then get the IPython notebook containing the code to run the tutorial. Uh, you will also have access to 75 chest x-rays that are from OpenEye, which is a, uh, you know, they're de-identified chest and abdominal radiographs obtained from a searchable repository of images hosted by the NIH that are derived from PubMed articles. And those are the images that we did the machine learning on. And then there's a README file, which is basically how to run the tutorial. And then can you go to the next slide? And so this is just what a Jupyter notebook looks like. So once you get Jupyter uh, installed on your computer, uh, you'll see that um, these notebooks are organized in cells. So you can run each cell independently and you can run the code in the browser so this is great for collaborative research or any sort of collaboration uh, and uh, they're pretty nice and uh, straightforward to use and again you can use python you can write do python scripts or r scripts and so this is the code we actually used uh, in the article you know how do you as you can, if you look, you know, if you're looking at the code, you can see we're, you know, loading the Keras library, we're, you know, loading our images, we're loading the directory containing the images, um, and then we're we're setting all sorts of parameters. And so, if you go through the article, it'll explain, you know, why you're doing what, uh, and the code that goes with it. And there's only about two pages of code, so it's pretty easy to follow. Here are some other screenshots showing what the code looks like, and 
as you can see on the top left, you're going to want to put your, your images in a certain directory structure. Um, in machine learning, there's a concept called augmentation. So in this example, we only trained off of 65 images, which is not a lot of images. But if you augment those images, meaning you provide variation to the original image, and as you can see in the image below, um, here are some variations that are provided. You know, we translate the image, we rotate the image, we flip the image. You can also shear the image. And these are all things you can do within the Keras library, and you can specify those pretty easily. Um, and then we use uh, Matplot, Matplot library, which is a very, uh, very popular uh, library in Python to plot figures in a variety of formats. And we show some code of how you can use Matplotlib to sort of plot training curves or validation curves um, from Keras uh, just to see how the model is doing. And next slide. And just to, to close it off, uh, if you're interested in learning more about deep learning in addition to the article um, at SIM 2018, there is going to be an introduction to deep learning in medical imaging learning lab. Um, so I highly recommend that you attend that. But there's also going to be quite a uh, number of sessions discussing artificial intelligence and mach machine learning, both scientific sessions as well as vendor discussions. Um, and then the closing session by Dr. Langlotz um, he's going to be talking about artificial intelligence as well. So I think SIM 2018 is going to be a great place to learn a little bit more about, or a lot more about, artificial intelligence and machine learning. Parth, thank you. Our, uh, our next speaker is Dr. Judy Chichoya from Indiana University. Uh, Judy is uh, our co-chair of the SIM Global Outreach Committee and a member of our uh, hackathon committee. Judy? Thank you, Paul, for the introduction. So, um, and the reason for this is, you know, where, sort of where you come from um, in the, you know, so I, I have to give a little bit of a context for my involvement in open source, because I think that's the, the message that you can, you know, take away from this webinar. And I went to medical school in Kenya, and then uh, moved to the U.S. to do my radiology residency. But, you know, back home, every time I visit, the, this is the common picture that we see. You know, files, patients take away their, their images back home, and so you don't have comparisons, and a lot of medical records are, are kept in boxes. And so earlier on, I'd been involved with uh, OpenMRS, which is the largest open source medical record system used in the world. There are 40 countries that use this system, but primarily done for HIV treatment. And so uh, as I moved more to imaging informatics and radiology, I figured that I was more interested in applying sort of um, knowledge into the informatics field, but also to make an impact as we went along. So as you can see on the next slide, there's a map of where OpenMRS is used. Uh, you're welcome to explore that. And so our article on this um, issue talks about how we've evolved from 2011 to build an open source radiology information system uh, across two open source communities, specifically OpenMRS and Libre Health. And so this, the first version was done uh, in 2011 to 2013 by students from University of Kauka. And it was really focused on the workflow where we were using, you know, the WASIS uh, image viewer, a Zebra Parks database, and some DCM4J DICOM libraries. And so at this point, we're just hoping to have a basic you know, very simple orders management and support some study interpretation and integrated uh, image viewer. But uh, during that time, as we evolved um, between version one and version two, is we, you know, Zebra Parks, you know, no longer was supported. And this is a common uh, problem as you, uh, once you're involved in open source, you have to sort of assess the maturity model, which uh, in 2013 was pretty earlier on. And uh, what happened was that we needed to change the path system. And so this uh, for, you know, uh, formed the focus of our version 2, which is illustrated on the next slide. And uh, you can see at this point we integrated with DCM4J, which is a very uh, popular open source uh, path system. Uh, I know several companies have built proprietary systems on top of this. And um, we use still an OVM uh, WebDICOM view and where and uh, improved 
you know, just linked back to OpenMRS, which uh, where we were able to provide the orders and work lists and, uh, you know, implement some MPPS status messages. And so, you know, so evolution just between version one, version two, you know, nothing simple is just connecting, you know, you're dealing with commun you know, connectivity and interoperability between different systems. But in version three, which uh, we see on the next slide, uh, at this point, uh, you know, this work has been ongoing for around 18 months and we, we have interesting uh, observations, I think, at this point. Uh, so, like Brad said, web, you know, at this point, some other things were going on in our community, which one was uh, being very focused on generating user stories. Now, in Africa, very few people will use desktops and, you know, just because of even the arrangement of the hospital, if you're doing rounds, and so mobile is really a big, big, uh, platform that you have to deliver on and that meant we had to start to think about um, you know DICOM web and uh, sort of building mobile architectures that were easy to maintain in limited resource settings and so at this point there's a popular um, project uh, called Cornerstone which has um, also runs uh, runs alongside an open source project called OHIF and this this is what's been the integration that we were looking for and then uh, sort of abandoning, you know, relying so much on DCM for chair and re using Authank because we could use DICOM web and um, then working on the middleware where we were building a backend API which was still using Spring Java framework but a front end that was very web driven using web components. And so um, on our next slide I want to sort of talk about our current work which uh, you can do a sample test using the link uh, that is posted. You can test the system there. And uh, one of the things about open source is that uh, most of us don't volunteer time or, and it's just really difficult, especially when you're not trying to have, you're not a big company uh, that is backing this up. But it's a really good way, one, to uh, help with onboarding and also future workforce. And so this, this year we have six Google Sum of Code students. Every student gets around uh, 5,000 uh, to work three months on an open source project and what we're doing is uh, we're implementing a complete uh, fire driven workflow and uh, implementing a, a machine learning project done by Mozilla called Deep Speech to help with integration and assess how it works and then there's this idea of web components uh, which is um, you know um, this new way of building progressive web apps where just the same way we know uh, things like HTML, in HTML when you say body body, uh, that the browser is going to just render body body, is that you can customize your own uh, web components. So let's say patient search, patient search. And so we are building those against the Fire uh, API and then integrating that with DICOM Web to release a full a sort of modernized architecture for this um, system and then uh, based on reliance of fire of uh, fire as a rest api we are integrating with the documents analytic engine because uh, all, every document is now stored as a json uh, object that is easy to index and um, stream and analyze using apache spark and so uh, on my next slide i'm going to talk to give you some links that you can join our community i think uh, the same membership can really benefit from participating in open source because one, uh, you really just learn how to implement new architectures and new um, software platforms. Last week I spent uh, my week at Google I.O. and really you can see, I think you can see the architecture based, you know, based on which um, we use our current systems is really old. I know it works for us, but you can start to see how some of the things um, that are possible when we use like a web a web uh, system in terms of analytics and user understanding. Uh, as we know, uh, doctors in the US at least have been pretty unhappy with the electronic medical record system. And this potential for innovation, I think can uh, really come from understanding some of these technologies. And since some of us are out of school and you don't want to invest the time to go back to learn, open source can give you an alternative to get involved and at the same time make an impact in lower resource areas where they wouldn't have the same technology. And so uh, please join our forums and uh, check out our codes uh, on the GitLab or you can tweet me and I can, I'm happy to involve you in our project. 
Uh, I know CIIPs always look for projects to maintain the certification. I think we have amazing, amazing help and an amazing community that can uh, get you involved and um, really use your technology to save lives. Thank you. Uh, Judy, thank you. And now I'd like to move over to the Q&A section. Uh, so in your go to a menu, webinar control panel, you'll see a question section. Uh, please enter a question there. I'm happy to ask the question of our authors. I think the first question uh, is going to go back to Judy. Uh, you really mentioned that open source projects are not just technology. They're actually online or vibrant communities. And I guess the question is, if a person reading this article is interested in it, how do they get more involved? In what ways and what roles can they be more involved in an open source community? So I think the very first step uh, that I always advise people is to just join a community and introduce yourself. Uh, all of us, at least most of us, have imposter syndrome. You're thinking, oh, I'm not a good coder or I won't do this. But we all bring such uh, interesting uh, skills or you've thought about something uh, or you read about something and so you can just come and share within the community so like if you want to work on this uh, risk project you should just come to our forums introduce yourself tell us what you do we'll welcome you and uh, right now we have once we understand your interest we can direct you to sort of uh, what may be more meaningful for your involvement so for example if you're an expert in standards you know uh, you could you know, we could definitely use some help uh, into, you know, thinking about the standards. So uh, last year we had a high school student redesign our user interface that we're implementing this year. So there's no skill, you know, that's not necessary, but uh, working in open source is really personally rewarding and um, helps you learn. And also you connect with amazing people and you make friends, uh, you know, and that's, you know, professionally pretty satisfying. So I encourage you to get started by just, you know, introducing yourself and then we'll figure it out as we go from there. That's great. Thank you, Judy. Uh, our next question is for Steve, and that is, um, what does it take to make an open source project successful? There's lots of open source projects out there. What does it take to make a really successful project? That's always a perennially good question. And I like to think of it as the same way as what makes a really good paper or talk. Um, make sure that you have a, um, a problem that a lot of people have, in other words, an, an itch that a lot of people want to scratch. If it's if it's a broadly applicable itch, and it's truly open, and you're you understand the requirements well, then there will probably be a pretty good path of people uh, at, at least willing to try it, uh, if not actively contribute. So I think that's one of the starters: is take on something that's a problem for lots of people that most people think there's a mature approach, but it's just for whatever reason not being addressed in the marketplace. Great, thank you. Uh, our next question is for Brad. And the question is, Is um, can you describe uh, what the uptake is of DICOM Web yet in uh, our vendor community? Yes, and yeah, absolutely. So uh, I recently did a survey, I'd say probably about actually not even that recently, four or five months ago, uh, looking at how prevalent DICOM Web is uh, for the ONC. Uh, they, they rank and, and collect data on all of the various standards and their levels of maturity. Uh, what I found was that uh, looking at all of the DICOM conformance statements uh, produced by uh, the various vendors, uh, there definitely is uh, an uptick in the DICOM Web support. Uh, so you can see, you know, you know most vendors support uh, the, uh, the retrieval, uh, I mean, it has been around for quite some time. Uh, and many of the latest versions are now starting to support uh, the, the querying by Aikido. Uh, I'd say a little bit less support for STO, um, but we're seeing actually uh, an interesting uptick in that because of uh, a new IHE, pro actually not even that new, IHE profile called WIC for Web Image Capture, which is using the, uh, uh, the STO part of DICOM Web. Uh, the other thing that, that, that I do want to em emphasize, overemphasize, uh, is that, you know, you know, by day I wear my product manager hat uh, and then I do a lot of work in the standard space uh, because I, I think it's really, really important. Uh, if, if something like DICOM Web is important to you, you have to tell your vendors uh, to uh, how to access it, how, uh, how does it work, uh, how it can be made better, uh, that that sort of feedback loop becomes 
critically, critically important. So uh, if you can't find information about how to use DICOM web with your vendors, do ask. Ask often. If I can shamelessly put a plug on the back of uh, Brad's answer there, um, I also work with the RSNA Image Sharing Network Committee, and we're doing some work for ONC and Sync for Science over there. And, and they actually uh, contracted with, uh, with uh, Harvard and then Harvard subcontractor, the RSNA, to develop uh, a DICOM web broker that could wrap an existing DICOM 3 system. Um, then it turns out that the RSNA came to us in the hackathon committee side to stand up a working version of it, which we have. And to Brad's exact point, uh, what the ONC and Sync for Science people wanted was basically Keto and Watto support, but it's actually going to be one of the grand challenges at this year's annual meeting to extend that to Stowe support, which I think actually somebody will knock out in a couple of days. Yep. I also wanted, this is Paul, I wanted to mention uh, a little bit that we've, so Sim has done a partnership with a class uh, for a research methodology in surveying health systems in what they're actually using in the health system around enterprise imaging, how they're handling CDs, how they're handling other imaging modalities outside of radiology. But part of the discussions are what DICOM web standards are they actually using? And we'll be releasing those results in just a couple of weeks at the annual meeting. And so I think uh, it really is a great question to see how uh, these, these really new powerful standards in FHIR and DICOM web begin to get uptaken into, uh, into, in, into not just RFPs, but into actual uh, real world applications. And so I think that it's gonna be very exciting to, to watch. So the next question I have is for Pars, and it's more of a technical question. Is uh, is the directory structure for the Hello World example required, or can you modify the code and find the images by traversing the directory? And are there conventions or standards for the directory structures? You uh, you can do it either way. Um, I did it that way in the tutorial because I think it made sense for people kind of getting started. Um, but you can simply just, you can even have like a CSV file, for example, telling you where all the images are at. Um, you know, there are many more ways to load data in. That just happens to be one way. Um, but if you if you go to Keras.io, they actually have a lot more examples on how to load your data in. Um, and the point in loading your data is to change everything into an array so it can be used by TensorFlow, for example. So um, some people like working with directories um, because it's more intuitive, so they do provide that, that route, which is nice. Great. Thank you. The next question is uh, to Brad is uh, describing the CGET equivalent in DICOM web, which I think you showed in your slide. Yeah. So the, the the closest equivalent uh, would be Watto RS. Uh, so CGET is where you are doing a uh, retrieve of instances uh, over the same connection, uh, which I think exactly is what uh, uh, Watto RS is all about. Uh, so I make my HTTP request uh, for a particular uh, study instance UID, series instance UID, and the SOPS instance of UID. Uh, I can specify them at any level. So if I want to get all of the instances in a study or a particular series, I can just request that. It follows RESTful methodology in that. Uh, and then what you get back uh, is a multi-part response uh, that ha has the instances that you had requested uh, delivered to you in that, in that bundle back uh, to you. Excellent. Thank you, Brad. And our next question is to uh, Judy and maybe Steve, is how friendly is the FDA and other regulatory bodies towards open source for diagnostic use? Another perennial question. I guess I would turn around and I would ask, you know, in your heart of hearts, if you're a radiologist, have you ever used like, um, I'm blanking on the name, but the, uh, but the Macintosh viewer to, to read out a case, Osiris. Osiris? Yeah. Yeah. Have you ever used Osiris to read out a case? If you did, you were using non-FTA software, although now there's, I guess, attempts to, to get a FDA version of it. So I think that's a slippery slope, and I certainly don't want anybody to take my advice to mean anything. I can only say that I think if anybody was trying to sell it, that clearly would be out of bounds. I think if an individual MD as a practitioner covering under the art of medicine, then I think that it's all on you. And, you know, like anything else in medicine, you know, you, you get your malpractice insurance to protect yourself. Um, and I think you could make a case 
that if you're using something because you believe in that specific case and that particular interest of that patient, it's a value, then I think you're probably okay. But I would, like I say, take it take it to your institution's attorney before I do it. As as the okay. only MD on the call, maybe Paris has a thought. Oh, hello. Well, I guess Judy is an MD too, but I mean, I think I oh, would I'm agree. Sorry, yep. I think <laughs> I would agree that. Uh, you know, I think if you feel comfortable using, you know, any software, or any device, um, as a physician, you know, we do have so, sort of a leeway to make that call, um, and you know, but it, it it would be sort of up to our judgment, and um, but but it, it couldn't hurt to you know ask the institution, you know, for for for, for what they think before doing anything like that. Um, so yeah, I, I, I would also. Yeah, and this is Paul. So I would say that uh, open source can be really good. If you think of what uh, part of the FDA process is called good manufacturing processes, open source is very good at building good uh, code that's e exposable. So I think it's actually a good step. I think there still needs to be a company that's willing to take that like a red hat and, and support it and test it to make sure it's going to be reliable and safe within a clinical environment to make sure it, that is you know, the FDA process. Uh, but I do think that uh, the code itself can be uh, the technology itself can be very amenable to this as long as it's being uh, it's being tested and supported in a, in a clinical environment. And so I wanted to uh, really thank our authors, uh, and uh, I really want to thank people for for calling or for joining our webinar today. We're really hoping this uh, this open access issue is, um, is a, you get a chance to take a look at it. It's inspiring to you, and you might even want to participate in one of these open source communities. Uh, we really encourage you to join us uh, if you want to continue the conversation with our authors at the annual meeting. It's just a couple weeks away uh, in D.C. at the National Harbor at the Gaylord National Resort. And uh, with that, I would like to uh, thank um, uh, the sponsor for the webinar, uh, AGFA Healthcare, uh, for supporting the SIM 2018 webinar series. I wanted to quickly mention that uh, to mark your calendar, to not just for our annual meeting, but our next webinar will be uh, Don Cram uh, on June 21st on mobile image, multimedia, and information capture across the enterprise uh, on Thursday, June 21st. And uh, lastly, uh, as you exit this webinar, please fill out the survey and submit your request for SIM IIP credits for a petition where we want to hear from you and hear which is what topics you're interested in hearing about and, uh, and how we can uh, support you within the imaging informatics community. And thank you. Have a great day.